Woo! Look at her go! Here in my hands is the power supply that's responsible for that fireworks display. And guess what, guys? We didn't try to kill it, and it isn't from some random AliExpress brand. This unit has five stars on PC Part Picker and thousands of sales on Amazon, and yet, it failed spectacularly during routine testing for Power Supply Circuit, our channel that's been testing legions of power supplies and along the way discovering that many power supply manufacturers aren't so honest. Some are over-representing their products and wait, some are underselling their performance? That's not what I expected. Well, either way, it's finally time to take a look at our power supply gauntlet. And when I say gauntlet, I mean it, because our power supply testing process has resulted in a staggering 23% failure rate, really separating the good from the, uh, <clears throat> well, bright, at least. Speaking of failure, I just failed to do a segue to our sponsor, uh, MSI. Their Core Liquid A15 AIO cooler is quiet, stylish, and best of all, easy to install. Cool down your high performance build by picking one up today using our link in the description. Nine months ago now, we launched our first labs team channel, PSU Circuit. And since then, we've tested 39 power supplies, nine of which died at some point during our test suite. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. First, it's time to take a look at our fully armed and operational power supply station because a keen eyed among you might have noticed that it looks a little different from how it looked two and a half years ago when we first unboxed this bad boy. Starting at the bottom, we've got our AC source, which is able to deliver three kilovolt amps, which is basically 3000 watts, but not quite because reasons. This is enough for us to test up to 1600 watt power supplies because we need to be able to briefly deliver 200% of the rated power for the power supply for excursion testing. As for why it isn't exactly double, uh, the uh, reasons. Anyway, above that, we have what Chroma calls their on-off controller, which is just a big relay, which is just a fancy name for switch. Then above that, we have our short circuit and over voltage protection tester. Moving up, we have our DC power source, which we don't really use at this time. And then above that, we have our timing and noise analyzer, which is basically a headless oscilloscope with a host of relays that can be used to automate functions like turning the power supply on or off or changing the characteristics of our load. Say, for example, to add capacitance. Then there's a shelf, which does shelf things. Above the shelf, we've got the connection panel, which allows well, easy connections so that poor Lucas doesn't have to go spelunking in the back of a rack every time a wire needs to be plugged in. Of course, the real meat and potatoes is up here, our 13 loads, an unlucky number for many a power supply. Basically, these guys use MOSFETs to dissipate the energy from our power supply as heat. We've got 12 400 watt loads that can be strung together to fully load any rail on any power supply up to 1600 watts. And then our 13th unit has two 100 watt loads, which we typically use for five volt standby and minus 12 volts since we don't really need a big individual load for those. It uh, can get pretty warm behind these guys. And beside that is a digital multimeter, which we use for the, well, the seven thermocouples that go into our test chamber to measure ambient air, intake and exhaust air for the power supply, and measures the connectors to make sure that they don't, you know, melt. We don't publish our temperature results yet, but it is something that we're working toward. Finally, there's the crown jewel of our tester, our Roden Schwartz MXO58 oscilloscope. She's got eight analog channels, 16 digital channels, which is nice. But the real benefit of this scope is the ease of programming and the nice waveforms you get to look at. Truthfully, we know we're kind of using the Ferrari of oscilloscopes to go get groceries, but that can be worth it when you acquire this equipment and sometimes it takes years to finally start using it, which, yeah, yeah, what's the deal with that? Okay, I do know the deal with that. The Chroma, it's not exactly user-friendly or documented. Making matters worse, the programming is very similar to assembly code, which turned the automation process for our testing from a two-month project to a 10-month project. For poor Lucas, thankfully I didn't have to do it. But now that it's finally done, we can figure out what power supplies are good and <clears throat> which ones are not so good, which brings us to an important question. 
What makes a power supply good? Well, at its most basic level, a good power supply must adhere to the ATX specification and deliver these voltages to your copy, regardless of the kind of load that it's under or the input power conditions. Now, we don't follow exactly the ATX prescribed test plan, but we try wherever it's practical and our tests are heavily inspired by ATX. The good news is pretty much everything we've tested, even the ones that failed, has pretty much operated within the ATX specification, until it didn't. But the bad news is we have seen some big differences in efficiency. In simple terms, the efficiency of a power supply is the percentage of the power that you draw from the wall that gets turned into useful energy that your computer can use. Now, many manufacturers market their power supplies with a little 80 plus certification that you'll find on the box. But in our testing, there were two power supplies whose measured efficiency didn't match their ratings. The Corsair SF850L and the FSP Vita 850GM. Both of them actually exceeded their rated efficiency. A result that is validated actually by Clear Results' own 80 plus testing. Why would anybody market their unit as 80 plus gold when they could have labeled it 80 plus platinum instead? When we talked to Corsair and FSP about this, we got similar answers from both of them. These power supplies, it turns out, were designed to be gold efficiency power supplies, but then their engineers went and did a bit too good of a job and they exceeded their target. But here's the thing. Even though their tested units exceeded the target, they're not confident that every single unit off the line is gonna hit platinum efficiency. So they decided they'd rather be conservative with their ratings. Also, in the case of Corsair, the design team had just plum finished the box and label designs with that gold rating on it, so they ran with that. <laughs> we verify more than just 80 plus though, which honestly is kind of falling out of fashion. And part of the reason for that is 80 plus only factors in efficiency from 20% to 100% load. So instead, we measure all the way from 2% load to 110% so that you know how your power supply is gonna perform when your computer's asleep, all the way up to when it is, oops, slightly overloaded. Now, I can't say that it'll make a big difference on your power bill if you pick up a C850 or C1000 from NZXT, both of which have outstanding 2% load power efficiency. LTT hat pros off to them. What I will say is that this expanded testing scope helps us to separate the overbuilt units from the underbuilt ones. While testing at 110%, we have registered four power supply deaths total, including uh, this one, which is not a good result. In fairness to these power supplies, 110% of rated power is out of spec, and we perform some of these tests with the input voltage and frequency being slightly off to simulate non-ideal conditions. But the thing is, with all of the protections that a power supply is supposed to have, an overpower or an overcurrent event really shouldn't result in outright failure. But sometimes it does. The Game Max power supply that we featured in the thumbnail, the one that Lucas is looking at here, spectacularly failed during this very test. The AC source on the tester went into protection mode, and when Lucas popped the power supply out of the test chamber, he wisely fired up his phone camera, plugged the unit into the wall, and yeah, you don't want that going on inside your PC. But, I mean, Linus and Lucas, that was probably just one bad unit, right? No. See, here's the thing. Anytime a power supply dies during our testing, we obtain another one. And almost every time, the second unit has also died. Across our overcurrent, overpower, and short circuit protection testing, we've found six power supplies that have gone to sleep permanently, securing our coveted We Cannot Recommend Award. See, while catastrophic failure protection is technically a recommended part of the ATX specification, we feel that any power supply that you spend good money on should do three things. One, it should protect you. <laughs> we can't have your house, and therefore you, lighting on fire. Number two, it should protect your computer. We can't have your motherboard, and therefore your computer, lighting on fire. And three, it should protect itself. We can't have your power supply, and therefore your power supply lighting on fire, producing molten material, or making startling noises. Another surprisingly effective killer 
has been our brownout test, which has claimed the lives of these three power supplies. This test is pretty simple. You know when the lights flicker briefly? Well, we're testing to see how long that needs to last before your computer will shut down. We're not even looking at surges or anything like that. It just turns out that some power supplies really don't like power getting turned off briefly and then back on. A surprising non-killer though is our excursion testing, where we hit the power supply with a 150% load for one millisecond, and then a 200% load for 0.1 milliseconds to see how it'll handle something looking at you GPUs, briefly drawing way more than it should. While this hasn't killed anything yet, there are differences in performance in these tests. So if you plan on overclocking, you're gonna to wanna to look for our power supply with all green check marks here. Now that we know what we're testing for, let's set up a test. Why don't you explain step one? Because it's not obvious to me looking at it. Yeah, so the first thing we do, we unbox it, find out any of the manufacturer's claims, and write all of it down for metadata that later gets uploaded to the website. Then we go through input and output ratings for the power to make sure that we're loading it correctly and that the loads are properly portioned to it and configured for that. So we're not nailing it on one rail and then leaving another one alone. And then we go through and we decide what tests to run on it, which is exactly the same for all of our standardized testing that we go up on PSU Circuit and the Labs website. And then we take kind of an inventory of all the cases that comes with it and quick measurements of the length so we have that data as well and then we can just run this cell in python and some code i've written on the back end uh, generates a whole mess of data and uh, files that we can run off of i said step one you gave me what sounded like at least like half a dozen steps that's great that's efficient step one 80 plus platinum this guy <laughs> it's not even titanium i think titanium is better next it's time for lucas to turn on the tester and the scope a lot of buttons. Yeah, now I can even reach most yeah. of them. Next up, we shove our power supply into the chamber and reposition our thermal couples according to the exact physical dimensions of the unit. Then it's time to plug into this guy. Connector board, interface board, I don't know what it's called and it doesn't matter, but shout out Seasonic for sending this thing over to us because it saves a ton of time. We can plug in as many connections as you could possibly find on a modern power supply. And the best part is this was some special work from Lucas, some tedious work from Lucas. We take our measurements right at the bottom of where everything plugs in, which is important because otherwise the length of these wires could affect our readings and we don't want that. Oh, there's one more thing. We have a thermocouple that we plug right into the uh, 12 volt high power. <laughs> you know, the one that has a reputation for being kind of melty. Once everything's hooked up, we start our tests at zero degrees Celsius. Then we move to 20 degrees Celsius and finally 40 degrees. Everything is automated except the temperature of this chamber. We could automate that, but it's actually nice to have a few check-in times to make sure that everything is looking good with the results. Our hardest tests are only done at 20 degrees Celsius. 16 hours later, we get this, which as you can tell, needs some processing, but fortunately that's automated by some code that Lucas wrote. Then from there, we get a script template for PSU circuit videos that gets filled in with the results that are sent to Emily. For the voice in the videos, we use Eleven Labs, an AI text-to-speech dubbing service. And specifically, we use Brian because we like his voice the most. It can take a couple of tries to get a good read from Brian, and I need to balance how natural he sounds with how accurate his reading is. Some more niche phrases like ATX tend to trip him up. 1000 ATX3, 2024, manufactured by Seasonic. Each video has a template with parts of the voiceover that don't change in blue down here, and then I insert the generated voice above that in green. Then the footage and graphics get added in, and after two to three hours of work, we have a video. Now, if you've ever watched PSU Circuit, you're probably wondering, why don't you guys just have a human voice the videos and then have a human fully edit it? And I get it. I would genuinely love to do that. But let me put it this way. So far on this channel, we have made an eye-watering $138 in AdSense. $138. Plus a few bucks here and there from private internet access VPN affiliates. And that's across all of the videos. So the economics of humans doing that stuff, they just don't make any sense. But that doesn't mean that the channel's going anywhere. We are committed to continuing to test power supplies and continuing to upload these videos because the data isn't just valuable to viewers of the videos, it's also incredibly valuable to LTT's ability to do build videos that feature power supplies that we can truly stand behind. Also, if you don't like the AI voice, you're not alone. 
but you can just read the articles at LTTlabs.com. You'll even find some extra data there. You might even find this segue to our sponsor. Micro Center. March is Monitor Madness Month at Micro Center. Try saying that three times fast. They have great deals on monitors of all shapes, sizes, and specs like this Alienware 34 inch OLED, 175 hertz refresh rate beast for $400 off. Whether it's something simple for your work setup or a companion for your ultra powerful gaming rig, they have something for everyone. Plus, if you want to save even more money, you can take advantage of their GPU trade in program. If you purchase the GPU at Micro Center, simply bring it back and receive an offer on the same day. They can even help you recycle your old tech or help donate it to someone in need if you need to make space for your new purchase. So click our link in the description to check out their Monitor Madness event. We'll also have another link there where you can get a free 128 gig flash drive if you visit their new Santa Clara store when it opens this year. If you guys enjoyed this video, why not check out the one we did on a 3000 watt power supply where you can see what our testing capabilities used to be.